We're standing in the, in the very heart of the campus of Lincoln University in Jefferson City, Missouri. Uh, this institution has a history that dates back uh, to the Civil War. Indeed, uh, I think you could argue prior to the Civil War. In Missouri, uh, as a consequence of an 1847 law, Missouri blacks were not allowed to be taught to read or write, uh, much less go to school. So uh, as a consequence of that, going into the Civil War, most African Americans uh, who were slaves, there were roughly 100,000 slaves in Missouri on the eve of the Civil War, and almost all were illiterate. In uh, the middle of the war in 1863, as the Union was struggling to uh, try to subdue the South in its rebellion, uh, the President, Abraham Lincoln, authorized the use of black soldiers to fight against the, uh, against the South. He, uh, he referred to them as the sable arm. And, uh, and so in uh, mid to late 1863, recruiters from the Union Army began going up and down the Missouri River Valley in the heart of the state recruiting black soldiers. So uh, these black soldiers, of course, fighting in the war, uh, actually many of them uh, uh, served in what was called garrison duty, uh, building trenches, uh, digging uh, ditches, uh, really hard manual labor, primarily in Texas and Louisiana. And uh, the monument uh, behind me is a monument to the soldiers of the 62nd and 65th United States Colored Infantry. In fact, uh, in January of 1866, the war was over. The soldiers of the 62nd were about to be uh, mustered out at Fort McIntosh, Texas. And they began talking around a campfire. Uh, how can we pass this legacy of learning on to the freedmen back in Missouri? And uh, they began to talk about raising money. They pledged money. They gave money. And, and it, it was an extraordinary sacrifice. Uh, some of these soldiers, privates in the United States Colored Infantry, were earning as little as $113 a year. Uh, some of them gave $100, almost a year's wages, to start this institute. They gave their money and their pledges to a second lieutenant named Richard Baxter Foster, who was a Congregationalist minister uh, educated at Dartmouth. I don't know that he'd ever been to Missouri. In uh, the summer of 1866, when it began to appear that Lincoln Institute might be established in Jefferson City, a local newspaper uh, ran an editorial opposing that move and expressed the fear that if Jefferson City became the place where Lincoln Institute was established, that it would, if the city would become a, quote, mecca, end quote, for Negroes throughout the state and, and indeed throughout the country. So there was hostility and, and there was difficulty. And so he ended up opening a school for two students in September of 1866 on a, on a site uh, roughly a half mile from here on one of the highest points in Jefferson City, just south of what was then the heart of the town, on a hill called Hobo Hill. There was a building there, a log building that had once been a school and had been abandoned because it was no longer fit for human occupation. But toward the late uh, 1860s, as it became clear that the 15th Amendment was gonna be enacted, the amendment that gave African-American men the right to vote, uh, in Missouri, uh, the radical Republicans were fearful that they were losing power. They had come to power and stayed in power by disenfranchising, by taking the right to vote away from Southern sympathizers who wouldn't take a loyalty oath. And so as the 1870 election approached, uh, the radical Republicans began to calculate how can they get blacks to vote for them because they knew at some point these rebels who had been disenfranchised were going to be allowed to vote. And so they, they, they fixed upon this man, James Milton Turner, who had been born a slave in 1839 in St. Louis, but educated at Oberlin College in Ohio. They, uh, they, they began to go to Turner and to say to him, uh, Turner, we need the black vote. And he responded, uh, what will you give me for it? What do you want? Make Lincoln Institute a state school. But in 1870, as this election approached, he was living here in Jefferson City. And he orchestrated this, uh, this deal whereby he delivered 20,000 black votes to the Republican Party in exchange for which Lincoln Institute got its first state appropriation of $5,000. Seven or eight years later, it would be totally taken over by the state. Lincoln Institute uh, was the only place of higher education that African Americans, the only public institution of higher education that African Americans could attend.
well into the 20th century. Uh, during World War I, many black soldiers fought and died for freedom during World War I. And uh, after the war, there was a, a, an increased clamoring for access to the state's public institutions, particularly the University of Missouri in Columbia. But the state of Missouri was reluctant to open that institution to African Americans, and uh, they offered a countermeasure. And that countermeasure was, in 1921, uh, they transformed the Lincoln Institute from institute to university. They changed the name and said to African Americans, now you have a university. The Lincoln University of the 21st century really, in many ways, traces its origins back 50 or so years to integration in the mid-1950s. Uh, there was serious talk about closing Lincoln University down after the famous Brown versus Board of Education decision in May of 1954. The argument being offered was that black students could go to white institutions now because of racial integration. Instead, however, um, the state and the city closed down a white junior college on, uh, in Jefferson City, the Jefferson City Junior College. And almost overnight, all of those white students came to Lincoln University. So the complexity and the complexion of Lincoln University changed almost overnight. Uh, when integration came, it was a school of about 600 students. Today, I think it's a, it's a school that's closer to 3,000 students. It's one of the most racially integrated institutions in the country.